been following the series, you know it's about inspirational people, people who encourage us to be better selves. This week, this guest, I have to say, lives up to that reputation. He's an artist and his name is Jim. Nice to meet you, Barry. This guy's story is phenomenal, which you will hear over the next 45 minutes. How are you doing? Very well, very well, good to be here. It's great to have you. Thank you. Now, I first saw you at an exhibition called The Other Art Fair. That's right, yeah, The Other Art Fair. Alternative Art Fair. Yes. And as I walked into the exhibition, I have to say, you know, I'm an, I'm an art lover, much into art appreciation. But when I saw your stuff, it literally, no pun intended, because a lot of it's in 3D, yeah. jumped off the wall and grabbed me by the neck and said, you've got to talk to this guy. And you saw, yeah. I was so enthusiastic, I was like, I've got to talk to you, got to it. give me a card. How did this all start? Well, to start with, I was a builder pretty much most of my life. But now, um, I have to interrupt you there. Now, this is the most inspirational thing you will hear. It carries you on such a journey that is amazing. So as you were saying. So I was doing a building job, um, just coming to the end of a refurbishment job and um, doing a floor. I happened to cut a piece of um, tile, slip the knife into my leg. Um, and it, as it went in, it went in really far. And I sort of said to myself, I was working on my own. I said to myself, this is not going to be good. So I literally stood up not wanting to look, but took my trousers down to have a look at what I'd done. And uh, there was no blood, there was no scar, there was nothing. I couldn't even find where I'd done it. I literally was looking around thinking, I know that went in far, I could feel it. Um, couldn't find it, so what did I do? I pulled my trousers back up and went, that was lucky, and carried on working. Uh, went home that evening, all was fine. Again, had a bath as I usually do, went to bed, woke up the following morning and I felt as though my leg was sore, but I kind of thought to myself, it's sore because I'd been doing a floor all day and I've been on my knees. On knees. And I just thought, oh, well, that's all it was. And I said to my wife, do you know what? I don't feel good enough to go to work, so I'm just going to rest. But then as the day had gone on, I started to feel as if I had some sort of flu symptoms. Um, but still didn't think a lot of it. When the evening came that evening, my wife had made a chicken dinner and um, she said to me, oh, I feel a bit, I feel a bit uh, ill. And I said, oh, yeah, so do I. And so we assumed we both had a bit of food. But we, we said to each other, you know, what, oh, maybe we've got a bit of food poison from the chicken. So I'd, I'd gone to go to the toilet because I was still laying in bed resting. And as I came back, I passed out in the hallway from the bathroom to the bedroom. And my wife couldn't pick me up, so she rung the ambulance. Now, the ambulance came and we told them that we thought we'd had um, food poisoning, maybe. They so you then had come around by the time the ambulance came, had you? Yes. Right. Just about at the point when they turned up, they'd lifted me onto the bed and then I'd come round. Right. And they checked my blood pressure, so they said, no, that's fine. Um, looked at me and said, no, we think you're fine and uh, just went off. And so didn't think much more of it other than... So you didn't go in the ambulance? No, 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 no. no. Right. They just checked me over and said, no, you seem to be OK. Blood pressure's fine. Went back to bed. Um, next morning, I woke up again and I was feeling worse and worse. And as the day, it started to get dramatically worse. And I was on my own because my wife had gone to uh, work. And then probably around about two o'clock in the afternoon, there was a knock on the door. And I was feeling really rough by this time, but not knowing. Again, just thinking of flu. Yeah. And uh, it was my father-in-law. And he said, oh, um, I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here to take you to hospital. I said, well, why am I going to hospital? He said, I, we think you need to go. There was no, I, you know, I didn't understand why, um, but I, I said, come on then, let's go. And it took me a lot of effort to get down the stairs by this point. And uh, we got into the car, and as he's just driving up my road, he started talking to me, you know, just trying to have a bit of banter with me. And I had to say to him, I can't talk to you. I literally cannot talk to you. I felt so ill all of a sudden that I couldn't talk. So I was sort of... In the car, we got to the hospital, spent two hours in the waiting room getting worse and worse and worse. 
till uh, they called me in. Um, the nurse took my blood pressure and she said to me, oh, this um, blood pressure machine is not working. So she go and get another machine. Off she went, that's fine, that's it. Put the next one on. This, uh, this machine's broken as well. You're so high. So, no, 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 no. Had no blood pressure whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, another nurse walked in the door at the point when she said that about the second machine. And she said, well, don't you think there could be something wrong with him? And instantly they, they checked my no blood pressure. I was rushed into, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, ICU. ICU. And then they literally, I can remember them cutting my trousers off. And that is it. That's all I remember. My wife says I was awake after that point for right. another day, but I don't remember anything. But back to the actual incident itself. Yes. So you're cutting the tiles. Yeah. And you felt like the knife went into your leg. Wasn't there a cut in your trousers? Well, not that. I, there obviously must have been, yeah. Right. But I didn't consider it because you. And then there I took was no down. blood. No blood. So what did it transpire? So what the doctors what? eventually told me after I'd come out of coma, etc., was as the knife had gone into my skin and through, it took the bacteria that lives on our skin naturally, we all have living yeah, on our yeah. skin, took it straight into the bloodstream. As the knife came out, it sealed itself, so the oxygen wasn't able to kill the, ba the bacteria. Yeah. Right. And then that, that, that going straight into my bloodstream wiped me out, basically. Wow. So it was that deep that it just went in, yep. sealed itself as you pulled it out. Absolutely. Now what had happened previous, I'd just cut a tile and thought to myself, well, this is getting a bit of an effort, you know, to cut right. it. I'm going to change the blade. So where I'd been working with a blade which was quite hard to go through, I put a brand new one in, so thinking that, that I was going to struggle yeah. the same way. I've gone... Whoosh, and, ah, right. and because it was a brand new blade as well, that's why it went so far into my leg as well. So how long had you been a builder? Probably 15, 15 years. Right. And so I had my own company, okay. had plenty of clients, had enough work probably to take me through to the rest of my life, really. <laughs> so, builder. Yep. This accident happens. You then go into hospital. Mm hmm And how long were you in a coma for? I was just over three weeks in a coma. Over three weeks? Yes. As he's telling me this story and it unfolds, it just becomes more amazing every time. I mean, three weeks in a coma, mm -hmm. and then what happened after that? Well, when I was in a coma, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you're, you're in a coma, you're not aware of what's going on. I wasn't aware of what was going on in, in the outside world. Right. But I was going through something really bad on the inside, you know, okay. like a, a, as far as, and again, it said that you don't remember what happened in your coma, but I remember everything, you know, every story. I saw, I saw my son, who, is, who was six at the time, I saw him when he was 13 in my coma. I went through different stories, different things that you just, I found hard to talk about for a long time because it was that horrific. So what, what it was is kind of like in the coma, I was going through these levels. I'd start up at this high level. Um, so when you say high level, what do you mean high level? Well, high it, level I can only describe it as, it's impossible. It was like four layers, basically. At the top, I would start, and it was kind of like working my way through just the most horrible things you can imagine with voices coming at me and things taunting me and etc etc and as I got round to one point then that would lead me off onto a story to do with either the past the future and to the point at each time I got down a level and if I'd passed it was as if I was on trial for something it was it was that bad it, and I'd get to the next level this would be horrific it would take me down to the third level when I got down to the fourth level um, I'd find myself laying on a bed with like the um, kind of clear, you know, when they put the clear um, yeah, yeah. sheeting around you. And I could see everything going on around me. And the thing was, all they had to do, when I got to that level, they had to call me Jim, okay? Right. My real name is Richard. 
So if I'm in hospital, if I'm in a bank or whatever, my real name is Richard. Right. So they're then. So what they would do is they would come into the room and they would say, oh, here we are, we see Richard. And the minute they said Richard, this would start again. This horror would start again. And I'd have to start again and go through the same thing that I went through again. It sounds impossible, but this is literally what happened. Well, no, I mean, because you, you've heard of people being in a coma, but very seldom do you get the opportunity to speak to them and find out you know, what they actually go through during that coma period. Yeah. And if they remember anything, because the usual assumption is that people don't remember when they're in a com coma. Yeah. Because you can't communicate with them. You think, well, there's nothing going on in their head. Mm. But obviously, so that's why sometimes you hear in the therapy, they're saying, well, talk to them because they can hear. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. But I was never aware of anything on the outside. Right. It was always it was just what always was happening internal. to me inside. And it continued. So this layer thing continued. You wouldn't think that it would happen again, but it would. I'd see the same visions. I was taunted the same. I had to go through the same sort of... It's kind of like, I don't know if you've seen The Matrix, and there's a point yeah, in The yeah. Matrix where he works his way through all of this stuff. And yeah, yeah. it's very much like that. And so I'd been through this three times. It got to the fourth time, and that was it. I'd had enough. And I said, you know, whatever you're trying to put me through, I, I, I refuse to do it. I said, you know, it, it, I was saying literally, if I'm going to die now, that's what it's going to be. Because I'm not so going to go, I'm not going to, basically it was telling them that I wasn't going to do what I wanted them, they wanted me to do in order to get back down there again. Wow. And so at that point, I got a bit, you know, a few things that I'd said, which I couldn't say here. But, <laughs> and as it happened, as I refused to, to play this game, as it were, these four layers went to the point where I was on the bed and I woke up at that very point when I refused to go through what they were going putting me through. Can you see my bottom lip hanging? I mean, and, and literally I saw them layers fall and I could go into much more graphic detail, but it's, it's not worth it. But it was horrific to the point that I, you know, I couldn't talk about it for And this was months. just over three weeks? Yes. Did you ever have to have therapy? No, about it after. therapy was offered to me. A, a, late, a nurse kept coming up to me and saying, look, you've been through a lot, you, you know, because even out of my coma, once I came out of my coma, I wasn't aware why I was in hospital, um, how long I'd been there or anything. But she kept coming to me. This, this woman would come and say, you're going to need therapy. You're going to need to talk about what you've been through. But you know, the whole experience is that the human body is so strong and powerful, yet still so fragile That's right. because then you think that it was just something that the bacteria went inside sealed itself stayed in your body yeah and it caused all of this yes so after the three weeks plus because yep. you said it was just over three weeks what then happened you were discharged or you had to spend an extra time in hospital i probably spent another week and a half there um and throughout that time, again, I think I'd been on, had so many drugs, if I think I wasn't aware yeah. still what was going on. I wasn't aware that I, I'd had, you know, quite a um, large piece of skin cut away from my leg. It was only on the day that I was discharged that the doctor said to me, oh, well, let's dress your wound before you go. And I went, dress my wound? And as he took the covers off, and they'd been doing it all the time at the hospital, but I was unaware of it. And probably a wound like this big, and he, he, he showed it to me and he went, oh, what a lovely wound. And I said, how can a wound be lovely, you know? But that's exactly was his words. And actually coming out of hospital, whenever it was dressed afterwards, people would go, what a really nice wound, what a clean wound, you know? So why was it, was it because of the injury that the skin was broken away or they had to cut it out? So what I had was, you're probably aware of sepsis. Yeah. That's right. And I had the worst form of sepsis, which is called negritizing fasciitis, which is a flesh-eating bug. Ah, yeah. So basically what it was doing, it, it was eating its way, fortunately, it was eating its way down my leg because they came to a point where they took my mom and my wife into a room and said, listen, we're going to do an operation here, and if it's come above his knee, we'll have to take his leg off. Right. So fortunately it hadn't. So they'd done the operation to cut away enough that, that you kept me here. Kept you there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which you need. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Need. Right, so now we get to the bit of the recovery. Mm. What was going on during your recovery? So probably I was 
six months in waiting for me whilst I was in a coma. Um, I lost the ability to walk. I didn't realise that, you know, I, I was laying on a bed and they said to me, oh, we're going to come and get someone to teach you to walk again. And yeah. I said, what do you mean? I can get up, I can walk. To realise that I couldn't walk, yeah. you know, so I had to be taught to walk again. And basically, I had to, walk. yeah, I had to bring myself back up to strength to have the skin graft done on my leg. Yeah. Um, and that, I had to wait six months till I was strong enough. I'd put my weight back on. I'd lost four stone in hospital. Um, I had to put the weight back on, be strong enough for the operation. Then I had three skin grafts in total on my leg to, um, for that to work. And it was only after I'd been sitting watching every box set under the sun, you know, with my legs up, I had my mum looking after me every day, she was cooking me food, etc. And I thought, I can't do this anymore, I can't watch telly anymore, I need to get up and do something. So literally one day, I don't know why I'd done it, I got up out of my seat and uh, went out into the garden, found a piece of wood, which was um, left over from the building job that I'd recently done got some paint, started. I had an, an idea of a piece of art that I wanted, which was similar to, to a piece that I'd bought many years ago. I thought, I'm going to try and recreate that. So I went out and I was throwing grey paint on it. And um, I was going to my mum, look what I've done, isn't this good? And obviously it was just a background, so I was just, yeah. you know, building it up. And I think she sort of looked at me and think, maybe he's gone a bit mad, you know? Now here is where this story becomes amazing. Just listen. So. I produced, not the art you see behind us, but um, a couple of airbrush paintings, um, which I just thought I'd done it to keep myself entertained, um, to stop me you know, watching the TV. I took them down to a gallery to um, have them framed, and uh, they went mad over them. They said, oh my God, we've got an exhibition coming out. We want to put these in the exhibition. Will you put them in and all this? And I kind of said to him, well, I'm happy for you to do that, but I said, I think it would be hard for me to part with them because actually these are, these are my recovery. Yeah. And um, actually, even while I was talking to them about them being my recovery, the connection of them was so much that, you know, I felt it here and I thought, oh, maybe I can't do it. So we put them in the exhibition. They didn't sell them because what we basically done was set such a high price that they wouldn't sell. Right. That, that was my way of trying to keep them. Okay. And um, so after that, I kind of felt as though I looked at this and started thinking, well, is this perhaps something I could do, you know? And uh, looking at the type of art, I'd used airbrushes, and I felt to myself, I can't compete with airbrush artists because right. they're so good and I'm just learning. So I thought to myself, I need to find something different, something that's not out there. Your niche. My niche. And uh, that's what i done. I was researching my tattoo, which is kind of what I did for myself coming out of what I'd been through. Oh, so you had this done after? Whilst lying in bed, I okay. was researching right. having my tattoo done because I thought life's short. You, you, my whole way of life changed. I thought, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, I've always wanted yeah. a sleeve. I'm going to do that. Because it could have been taken in a moment. Exactly. That's what people don't and realize. whilst doing that, I came across an image um, of an art guy called Chris Kakuzi. Um, that does similar work to this. And I thought to myself, I can perhaps try and do my take on what he does. Right. And that led me to do this. And literally, Beethoven that sits behind me was the start. Oh, that's the first one. Mm -hmm. So there was never anything artistic before, or? I wouldn't say there wasn't anything. I've always been slightly artistic because I was a photographer. Um, when I left school, so, you know, lighting, composition, I worked in studio, so kind of, right, there was so that sort of... aesthetically aware. Yes. So, like, as a photographer, you, you, you go through life seeing everything as a, as a photograph kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And so that's what you see in my work, the composition of an actual piece. So you had that kind of aesthetic feel, eye, as a photographer. Yes. What made you go into being a builder and not pursue a photographic career? It was just at the time when I was a photographer, pay was really terrible. You'd work yeah. as, it was an honor to work in a studio. You'd be an assistant photographer. Yeah, right. so you would do all the work, you'd set the photography up, set the lighting up, the photographer would come in the room and 
take the picture. And actually, you've done it, but actually, he's the photographer. Yeah. And so your pay was terrible. So yeah. literally, I left just purely f for just money reasons. So there was always that love there? Was there always the absolutely. love, even though you'd left it? And yes, gone into absolutely. The building? Right. But life changes, doesn't it? Things exactly. take you in different directions, different paths. Absolutely. And I'm very much a believer of your path of life is kind of set. I'm a bit like, that's how I think. And Amazing though, so you've come out of this coma and you've suddenly got this talent that was latent yes. beforehand. Yes, but you do hear of that in many coma cases. Yeah. You hear of people that came out of comas that could play a piano all of a sudden, or they could speak Italian, or you yeah. know, so it's kind of like it is there, but something inside you unlocks that inside of this coma. Yeah. And then subconsciously, what I was finding as I was building my art pieces, there's kind of visions. The end result of what I do now is kind of like building like a sculpture of stuff that you could only see, i.e. in a coma state or in your dream state. You know, because anything that you see in my art is not necessarily what you're going to see in the real world. So it's kind of like yeah, it's what you very, could only see in your dreams. It is unusual. I mean, we're going to pan through in, in a minute, but I mean, it is so outstanding and so different. It, it's like a collage of a fantasy world. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. It's creating a fantasy, looking um, kind of like they sort of look into the future. You know, kind of like when I said I was in my coma, I saw the future, only what I could say, you know, right. who, who would say they could see so this. So when did this take place? <clears throat> what, what years was it? So four years ago, I had my accident. It's as recent as that? Yes. Four years ago? Yep, so four from years. From coma? Yep. To the airbrushing? Yep. To this? Yes. So basically, this has been three years in the making. So you went from airbrushing, found your niche, yep. and then started developing sculptures or? 3D. So the lenticulars that you see here are... I'm trying to get that name right all the way through. <laughs> practicing. Thank goodness he said it first. Lenticulars. Thank you. So basically what I did is I built enough sculptures. I started to see, once I'd built one, I kind of thought, could I do that again? You know, how am I going to better the first one that I've done? And then I produced the second, and actually it became that better. And I evolved my style as an artist as I built each piece. So I went on to number three, number four, number five. And then it got to a point where, you know, someone had seen it and said, listen, this is going to be big, you know? And then, you know, the realisation that actually I could make a living doing this came. And then I thought to myself, but then how could I let this go? You know, because it meant so much to me. Again, like what the airbrushed paintings yeah, yeah. were, this was the same thing. So I thought, well, how can I, if that's gone, what will I have? So I came up with these lenticulars. Right. In order that what would happen is the originals would sell and I would have something equally as good to keep for me. But then through going through the process of this, it's turned full circle now. So the lenticulars have become much, you know, they've taken over now. And As I get to, to the sculptures. Yeah, so yeah. I can retain the sculptures right. whilst So do all the these. lenticulars start with us from a sculpture? Yes. So, so there's always a sculpture first. Yep. And then So basically, once the sculpture's finished, I can take it along to the studio and it's um, photographed 30 times. Um, right. And then all of them 30 images are then interlaced on a computer right. that produce a 3D, a 3D image. Because I was going to say, how do you actually get this done? Yeah. So what, what you see here is when that image is produced, so when you're looking at it on, on, on a table and that print is sitting there, you can't actually see that. It's right. only once we put this lenticular lens over the top that it translates it into a 3D image. Ah, I see. Because normally you would need 3D glasses to see yeah. 3D, but no, you're, you so see 3D. So the equivalent of the 3D glasses is this is the lens. lens that Absolutely. covers it. But there are 30 of those images on top of each other. Yeah. What, so are they slightly out of line or are they all just on top of each other in the same... So the computer translates um, the image into just lines. Right. And then each line in these lenticulars, you can see it's made up of lots of yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah. Each line is a lens. 
So it's like a triangular lens that then translates the line from the print wow. into what we were able to see. So how did you even develop this? It just sounds so... Lenticulars have been around for a long time, probably right. 25 years. Okay. But what you is generally... 25 years a long time? 25 uh, years is not a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lot more than 25 years. But a lot, of years, people, okay. <laughs> a lot of people think it's a brand new idea, but it's not. You see lenticular in art, coming into art very much now. It reminds me of little cards we used to have as, right. as children. Yeah. And you used to do that twist That's it right. with light and yep. you, you'd see different images or... Yeah. So it, it was just a, um, a development in a way of producing 3D, which is your sculpture, into a print, but actually gaining that 3D. You know, and with my work, I, I, I find that um, from a sculpture point of view is when you walk up to my sculptures, they kind of suck you in. You know, in a Tell way that, about it. Yes, you know, you, know, you need to go in, you need it, to find yeah, more. Yeah. And what the lenticulars do, they add a little, A, they soften the sculptures, but B, they add a little bit of mystery because you cannot see the same as what you could see in a I sculpture. Mean, we're going to get some close-ups later, but I mean, when you look at them closely, there's so much going on in them. They're like little people, little babies, screws wire, sword, yep. there's just so much going on in there that you, you don't take it all in just glancing at it like that. The closer you get, literally the more you see. That's right, and that's you getting sucked in, you know, so when I talk about being sucked into yeah. the piece. The more you see, and it's like, the more you see, the more there is to discover. Yes, and down to the point of where my wife, for instance, you know, two years down the line after she sees them every day, would say, I don't remember that piece being there. I don't remember this yeah, piece being I didn't there see because that before, exactly right? because oh, your mind yeah. your mind gets taken to a certain point oh, and you yeah. and, and you kind of get led on a journey by the pieces that you concentrate on the time when you see it. But the next time you'll be concentrating on another piece and it'll be taking you on another journey. And so inside each sculpture are small little stories. I build small stories in and around all of the pieces. So the depths of them, you'll have a story that will start at the beginning. And as I build that up, I'll build another story on top of that and then another one on top of that. So there's stuff. If you, if you want to keep looking, you'll keep finding. It's, it's just amazing. So were you ever artistic from a child or through school? Or, or is this just something that developed in later life when you left school as a photographer? I think... I enjoyed drawing. Right. I was never really any good at it, right. but I would still have a go. You know, I could draw a room in perspective and stuff like that. But no, I think, you know, photography is what, you know, is, is, the, is, a, is a type of art in itself. Yeah. You know, and, and, and as I say, that, that leads me to see when I look at a piece of art, when I stand back from one of my sculptures, it needs to look beautiful from afar as well as when you're close up. Yeah. So I'm always looking at it from a photograph point of view. So this is, hence why they worked so well in the lenticular form in the end, because Amazing. actually I the composition is... It, as you can see, I'm still blown away by it. <laughs> <laughs> I was blown away by it as the first day that I saw it. I just think it's absolutely fantastic. And I mean, you are Mr. Inspiration as far as I'm concerned, because you often hear people say that if you can think it, or if you can dream it, you can be it or yes. do it. Yep. But you didn't even think it or dream it. No. And you are being it. I am. So that's inspiration in itself. Yes. Yes. So I met you at the first, at your first exhibition. My first ever solo first show. Ever exhibition. Yeah. How did it go? Fantastic. It was received by all all walks of life. I had people standing. You know, I'll be talking to certain people, and then people will be standing to shake my hand, and I'm like. <laughs> you know, one, one guy was shaking, literally shaking. He said, I, I just want to shake your hand and uh, yeah. wanted to meet you. I've been following you on Instagram, etc. Wow. And that's kind of like a crazy world that you're not used to, you know, but it was lovely. It was, there, there was no negative feedback, which, you know, obviously sometimes you get, it well, was yeah, all positive, you know. you're exposing yourself. Yes, you? and yes. You're exposing yourself once you're on exhibiting, yes. you're exposing yourself. Yep. Not everybody has the same passion about it that you have. Exactly. Each one of these are your child. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you know? Yep. Not everybody sees it that way. So it's great that, you know, you took all your children out and no negative feedback. No, and it was received so well. And obviously, from my first point of view of being a first ever exhibition, 
I was kind of worried that would I be able to talk about my art in that way? Would I be able to answer all the questions that people were going to ask me about my art? And you know, if you're talking about what you do, as you said to me earlier, it comes easy if you're only talking about what you yeah. do. And it did. And by the fourth day of being there, I was just full of enjoying everything that I was telling people. I was being able to guide them from the first piece that I made over to the second piece to the fifth piece, where, which is this piece here, yeah. which has got more going on than any other piece and trying to explain how my work evolved from the first piece, literally yeah. to the fifth, which you see here. And I mean, the thing is, it, it's really, what should we say, encouraging when you're exhibiting yourself and laying yourself bare yep. and people are coming and are as enthusiastic about yep. your yep. stuff as yep. you are. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it was just um, one of the biggest uh, reasons for doing a solo show as well was I was aiming it at galleries. I was looking for galleries um, right. to take me on. Um, which I've, you know, I met a few galleries there as well, which I'm was sure really good. Did. Yeah. Um, but no, it couldn't have gone any better. I came away after four days absolutely exhausted. I didn't realise that such a thing could be so exhausting as well. Well, listen, just moving these around alone, yes. getting these into the studio today. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And and, and it was at the end of the show, we were exhausted enough from what we'd already done, and then we had to get them all back home and the worry of having to, you know, get them back home safely. We did that. So it was just a brilliant outcome. What's your next move? So I am seeking representation from the right galleries, as it were. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. a case of meeting with galleries at the moment. I'm having them over to my studio. Um, I have a gallery at home as well, which I display all this. And it's kind of like finding the right place for me at the moment. It will come. Yes. It will definitely come. Yes. There's, there's no doubt about it. Because this is outstanding stuff. Um, I'm still just <laughs> blown away. But I want us to go over and look at the sculpture. Yes, now. yes. Um, because as you said, the sculpture is always the starting point yep. for these yes. lenticulars. I love saying that word. These lenticulars. Well, you, you brought one. Yes. Um, which is the sculpture of the Beethoven that's over there. No, the birth of destruction is over oh, there. Oh, yes, it's this one. Yes. That's right. Okay, so we're going to go over and look at this birth of destruction. Right. Now, talk me through this because where, where did you start? So. This was my second piece that I ever made, right. Beethoven being my first. Oh, look, this was my second. Phone in there? It is. <laughs> so this, this, this piece is called The Birth of Destruction. So what it is actually telling the story of is these couple here being chained together by these um, love-giving cherubs, okay. I call these, yeah, to produce children. Right. And then the whole moral... I don't generally, when I'm putting my art out there, generally try and tell everyone about the stories that I put in them. Right. I kind of give you the title and let each individual make up their Take own mind. what they... Exactly. Get from but it. from this point of view, I'll explain exactly what this was to do with. So this is the baby being born into the world. And then all this tells the story of journey of all of our lifetimes, from being a baby and things that may corrupt their minds etc so if you look in close here I've got like a, a little baby in there that's got an ADHD tablet for a head yeah television, a television for a head a mobile phone oh right I realize the mobile phone is the head of the, the young head child of the baby yes wow. so they're all influences on what may turn our children's minds right from going in the right direction, the right direction. Because some of these cherubs are devils. In yes, fact. so these ones are the devil ones on the outside, and right. the love giving cherubs are the nice looking cherubs that are still got lovely faces, little wings, and. These devil cherubs have got teeth like me. <laughs> so the way I go about making these pieces is I go out to um, antique markets, flea markets, right. car boot sales, trying to find all these little pieces that people regard as. You know, what do we want this for? And they throw it in a box. So I'll be out five o'clock in the morning looking in boxes to try and find all these little pieces, broken, broken toys, broken yeah, anything. Everything they're like cog wheels. Yeah. So where do these things come from? Are they like from innards of a clock so they, or I from use, models? 
Inners of a clocks is a very good one because I buy a lot of old clocks that are past working, break them down to use these cogs. Now right. these cogs follow, follow my work across most of my pieces because I feel that the cogs represent time. So it's describing Amazing. time in my work. Okay. So the cogs represent all the time. So these, these little uh, cherubs here carry in time in their little baskets yeah. there, yeah? And they use them to chain them together for a certain amount of time for what needs it to happen. It really is one of those things that you just want to touch it, but I'm, I'm really fighting, holding back not to touch it because you just want to... <laughs> As you see, when, when you came to the show, they were in glass boxes. Yeah, because everybody wants to touch it. So and home and they're normally locked missing. away, yeah, yeah but exactly. letting you see it like this is much nicer. Indeed. So you asked me, um, how does it start? Yeah. So I bought this frame from a lovely couple in Islington who said they'd cherished this mirror for so long. It'd been with them for 20 years. And I said, ah, oh, it's going to a good home. I said, <laughs> I said, I'll send you a picture of what I do with it when, I, <laughs> when I'm finished. I haven't done that yet. So I start generally with a centerpiece, which would have been this lovely couple, the frame. And then I build this story. So at the point when I had the frame and I had th this piece in the center, there was no story. Right. Yeah, so what I it do is it's coming it to evolves. You. The story yeah. evolves, the title comes. Once I got the title, so once I'd done this and placed um, the little baby at the top, then the title comes and then I can work on the story as I go. And it's kind of like each piece that I've done to date generally takes me around about six months to complete. Right. And that's due to the constant battle that I have of putting on, taking off, putting on, taking off. So, you know, I could be working on this piece for... So in actual fact, this is much more difficult than that. Oh, absolutely. This is, this is quite easy compared to this. Yeah, this is really where the work goes in. You just take 30 pictures of it, put that on the computer, that's... That's it. But that looks so impressive. But without this, this couldn't exist. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But Really, this is what takes the time. So let's have a look at this one now. This is the lenticular of this. Yes. Now, now what, what I've always found is to photograph this for advertising purposes is actually quite impossible to get what you see when, when yes. we look at it now. Because as you move, you're seeing something different every That's time. That's right, it flips. Yeah. It, it has three flips. So actually, like that baby will be looking at us now, and then as you go round, it would look at you again in the centre, and then likewise as you go round again. Yeah. Just amazing. OK. Just great. Come, take a seat. Now this one, talk us through this. I've got him talking so much he needs a drink for it. I do. <laughs> so, again, this one is called The Forced Resurrection. Right. Now this started with this um, beautiful Jesus that I bought from um, Newark Antique Market, which I go to once a month off a guy from France. Absolutely beautiful. And I, and I bought it in the know that I'm going to use that for a piece one day, you know? Yeah, okay. And then I started literally again like that one I explained to you. That was the start of the whole piece. Oh, so you started at the bottom with this? Yes. Thing. And so um, I built a framework where Jesus is and uh -huh. done the whole piece there. And then I built that story. Like I say, then it starts evolving. I, I, I have got the title, False Resurrection. We're bringing Jesus back. This, this, this tells the story of um, basically the end of mankind or nearly the end of mankind. Because these look like wings almost. Yes. So basically what, what's being used is basically everything that's left. There's a battle going on basically. You can't actually see it here so much. But it's a battle over what's happened is the universe has come together. Alien life forms. Um, the greatest mind. This represents the greatest mind. They've put right. the greatest mind together in order that they can use everything organically from the end of the world to produce, to bring back Jesus Christ. So this Jesus is the Christ. mind, the, the brilliant mind. And, and you can see the these bits coming out here and this coming down. And these are two different worlds, is it? Fighting yes. with each other? Yes. Okay. So there's a battle going on over the people that want the resurrection of Jesus over the ones that don't. But actually, okay. as far as um, from a universe point of view, they're only interested in saving mankind. So this is talking about and, and, and trying to tell you about 
what they needed to do to save mankind. Now this one over here is Beethoven. Let's just go and have a look at this. So this is, this was the, my first piece. The first piece. The first ever piece. So at the point when I made this piece, there was, um, I didn't have so much, like I didn't have a studio full of stuff like I've got today. So I was actually literally started with Beethoven. I'd bought Beethoven. Well, so that's just a bust, is it? Yes. Um, so I bought the bust. I transformed him and he sat on my um, hallway uh, windowsill for quite a while um, until I started building up stuff that I needed to create this piece. Right. And so it was kind of like the bare form of what I was doing. So m my style as, a, uh, 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 as an artist started to develop more and more. As each piece came on, you would see the style of an onyx piece basically coming more through as, as, as each piece that I did. But from this point of view, this was the one that I couldn't bear to get rid of, you know, right, as far as the set, because it was my first one. But um, it, hence the lenticulars were born out of this particular piece. Right. And okay. then the, 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 the success of ju just the reaction that we got from the first piece led everything exactly forward. led it forward from there. So when did the name Onyx come about? So to be honest, I was I was kind of um, I was in talk. Basically, I invited um, a friend of mine. He's a producer in the theaters. I said to him, you know, I, I need a powerful name to go with my work, you know, I'm, I, I, and, and he said, look, I'll come over and we'll sit together and we'll try and come up with something that represents your work. Um, and we, we had a great night together, you know, experimenting with things. And basically he came out with it. He, he said, Onyx. And when he said it, it just seemed so exactly. right, you know, it was right. And, and, and researching um, what Onyx is, I mean, it's um, a black stone. And um, when they talk about what its powers are, they talk about the uh, black onyx um, takes you into the dark. This is what it says. It takes you into the, the dark before leading you towards the light. Now that's kind of Perfectly representation of what of my, story. yes. So, you know, in, in, onyx, the dark inside the light is the slogan that I use and for my know, work. The, the, the backgrounds are dark as well and black, it kind of, is in keeping with yeah. the whole Absolutely. process that is you, not just your experience of yep. going into the dark and coming into the light, but how your work is represented yes. and how it's placed. Yeah. It, it fits perfectly. Yeah. And so, although, you know, it, it, my wife always thought that my art was quite dark and at first she, she was afraid for her friends to see it because they thought they might think something was a bit Weird. crazy with me, yeah. you know? And, uh, but I always said to her that I create art which has got dark tones, but actually yeah. there's hope. It's, it, it's yeah. trying to show there's hope in all my pieces, you know? So although you have dark, there's always light. And like you say, from my coma, there was dark, dark yeah. and then there Coming was light. The light and it's just one now journey of light. You have to make sure you shine all the time. Yes. Keep shining. Yes. Keep shining. Don't stop shining. No, like no, no, no. Coming for you. So what are you doing from now on? You've got more exhibitions, I know you said you're looking for a yes. representation and galleries. I think once I decided that this was going to be what I'll be doing, you know, I had a gallery in mind who concentrates on 3D sculptures. Okay. Um, and I put it in my mind, I want to be at this gallery, right. you know, and... Um, Will it to you? Will exactly, it? that's what I was doing. And, I, and basically I thought, right, I'm going to ring the gallery up one day. I rung the guy and said, hi, my name's Onyx. I produce um, sculptures, 3D sculptures. I'd love to come and show you them. Um, most galleries just go, yeah, just email us and we'll uh, get back to you. But this guy said, look, I've got five minutes today at three o'clock. I said to him, that's all I'll need. Yeah, Went down to the gallery, yeah. <laughs> yeah. took my book down to show him and he was blown away. Uh, he's offered me an exhibition which is coming next month, um, which is part of the Found Art exhibition. Um, that's a, a gallery called the Wolf Gallery in, in uh, Tottenham Court Road. Right. Um, so that was the big one for me. That was the one right. that I'd aimed, you know, that was, you know, I'd always aimed for that gallery. And right. so that one's coming up. So that's special for me. You know, that, that, that one means a now lot. I want you to give all the details into the camera, yes. website, exhibitions, everything, because I want everyone to go and support you. Right. So let's have it. So you can find my work at 
uh, www.onyxartworks.com. Um, I am on Instagram, which got some lovely images of everything that I do, my studio, my gallery. Um, you'll find that at uh, Onyx Artworks um, okay. on Instagram. Um, if you want to come to the show, which is going to be at the Wolf Gallery, that'll be on, on from the 23rd of November um, for two weeks. Um, yeah, but I mean, Instagram is such a big thing nowadays. It is. It is. Not, social media, I mean, the biggest, Judge Judy, mm. Oprah, they've all got a social media yeah. whole network. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, yep. the lot. So, you know. So, um, so that's kind of like, has been my third step. Obviously, the sculptures was my first step, lenticulars second, and now my social media is something that I've been working on. So, yeah. you know, it, it's very new. I'm looking for followers and stuff. This is what everyone seems to need these so let's days. So, the website again. So, the website is onyxartworks.com and Instagram is onyxartworks. Right, okay. Well, Jim, Onyx, Richard, I'm not sure what to call you. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Barry. Great to see you. And I'm going to be following you now, definitely. I'm not sure I can afford to buy one, but <laughs> I can at least come to the exhibitions and look at them. Absolutely. Yes. It's been brilliant. Thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure to talk with this guy. If anything resonates with you, please leave a message for us on Facebook, Instagram, or the website. And this guy here is inspiration itself. As you say, if you can think it or dream it, you can be it. And as you see, it's possible to be it, even if you haven't thought it or dreamt it. Until next time, take care.